Are we ready? Good morning, everybody. It's time to worship. You guys want to stand? Is it good to be here this morning? It's always good to be assembled together, isn't it? Okay, Lord, thank you for uh, today and uh, the nice weather, and I pray that uh, you'd be with this service and just uh, that we can worship you and praise you and just pray you anoint uh, Greg's teaching, Lord, and just have it, uh, again, speak to our hearts and teach us and correct us as, as you will, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so it's been a hectic week, so I apologize. I, uh, I copied last week's, or last time I did worship, we're doing the, most of the same songs, so... Uh, There is no rock, there is no God like our God. There's no other name that's worthy of all our praise. The rock of salvation that cannot be moved, he's proven himself to be faithful and true. There is no rock, there is no God like God. There's no rock. There is no rock. There is no God like our God. There's no other name that's worthy of all our praise. The rock of salvation that cannot be moved. He's proven himself to be faithful and true. There is no rock. There is no God like ours, rock of ages, Jesus is our rock, rock of ages, Jesus is our rock, rock of ages, Jesus is our rock. God like ours. There is no rock. There is no God like our God. There's no other name that's worthy of all our praise. The rock of salvation that cannot be moved. He's proven himself to be faithful and true. There is no rock, there is no God like ours. Rock of ages, Jesus is our rock. Rock of ages, Jesus is our rock. Rock of ages, Jesus is our rock. There's no God like ours, rock of ages, Jesus is our rock, rock of ages, Jesus is our rock, rock of God like ours. There is no rock. There is no God like ours. Your love, oh Lord. Reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the skies. Your righteousness is like the 
mighty mountains. Yeah, your justice flows like the ocean's tides. And I will lift my high voice to worship you, my King. I will find my high strength in the shadow of your wings. Your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness Stretches to the skies. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Yeah. Your justice flows like the ocean's tide. I will lift my high voice to worship you, my King. And I will find my high strength in the shadow of your wings. And I will lift my high voice to worship Worship you, my King, and I will find my high strength in the shadow of your wings. Your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heavens. Faithfulness stretches to the skies. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour. sin runs deep your grace is more and where grace is found is where you are and where you are Lord I am free holiness is Christ in me Lord, I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you, and teach my song to rise to you when 
temptation comes my way. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, and when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his loving face, I'll rest on his unchanging grace. Through every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds with it. Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is seeking sand, all other ground is seeking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found. Dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is seeking sand, all other ground is seeking sand. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground ground is seeking sand, all other ground is seeking sand. Amen. Lord, just thank you that um, although things are shaky right now around the world, Lord, and around us, and but you, you are the solid rock that we can stand on, and we just uh, thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Heath. Thank you for what you bring to our music ministry. It's just such a blessing. And, you know, just you sing those words and you think about um, so many passages of Scripture and how we're reminded of who our God is. And it's just so great to be here to worship Him. 
And, uh, you know, I was thinking about that's what we're going to be enjoying in heaven. That's what we're going to do in the Lord's presence is get a chance to sing and to never stop. I mean, as long as you want to sing, you can keep singing. And you won't have a voice like mine that can't sing. You'll have an actual voice that can sing well. So um, what, a, what a great thing that is going to be to look forward to. Our scripture reading comes from 1 Timothy chapter 1. I think this is the words of the Apostle Paul. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement, deserving full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am the foremost of all. Yet for this reason I found mercy, so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now, to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. If you've got your Bible, go ahead and flip over to the Gospel of John. We're going to be continuing our study in John, starting in chapter 8, verse 1 this morning. You know, it sure is great to, as Heath said, you know, to to be here and with God's family as brothers and sisters in Christ, and, you know, to to be able to, uh, to be together for the purpose of, really, we could say, essentially meeting with God. You know, I was thinking about that, and when we draw near to God, um, when we meet with Him, what does that entail? Well, certainly we hear from Him through His Word, and we get into it, we study it, we exposit it, we um, grow through it, we learn who the Lord is and um, the things that He has to teach us and to show us about Himself. And then, you know, we also... um, not only get to hear from him, but we get to express ourselves to him. And we do that through prayer and through worship and song. And I I think that's such an amazing thing that we get to do, that we get to express to the Lord our gratefulness, our recognition of who he is and his greatness, and um, to declare that as an expression from ourselves to him. Um, There's really nothing quite like it. And it's just a privilege to be able to, to gather and to do that together. Sometimes I, I, I think through some of the other um, churches I've been to, especially some of the, uh, like the black churches where they, they'll just go on singing and singing and singing and singing for hours, and it's, it's fantastic. Um, it's, it really is a treat to be able to get to do that. Well, as we turn our attention here to the Gospel of John, um, we we first of all want to come to the Lord with the right uh, perspective, the right attitude, the right frame of being, I guess we could say, the perspective of walking with the Lord, of walking in close fellowship with him, of being guided each step by his Holy Spirit and not just being led around of ourselves and by our own desires and our own um, priorities and our own uh, sinful natures. We want to walk according to the Spirit, and so the thing that we know does that causes the problem that um, gets in the way is sin, and so we want to come humbly before the Lord. We want to take care of any sin issues, so we'll have a moment of silent prayer where we can all do that, and then we will open in prayer together. So let's begin with prayer this morning. Father, we come to you this morning desiring an attitude of humility and recognition of your greatness. Lord, may that um, be the very thing that so changes and um, transforms us. As we come to your word, Lord, may we come before your word with awe and reverence, recognizing that you have chosen to speak to us in an incredible way. Lord, we see the 
the various things that have been recorded by uh, the human authors that you chose to use, such as the Apostle Paul and, and here the Apostle John, we get to see um, their unique contributions as people with the unique personalities and, and gifts and talents and expressions that you um, gave to each one. But at the same time, Lord, these are somehow, by the work of your Holy Spirit, your very words. And they're the words that change us. They're the words that carry so much power that we can study for a lifetime and still learn and learn and learn. Lord, thank you for speaking to us through your word this morning. We ask that we would set aside the things that distract us. Lord, whatever that is for each person here, we have various things on our minds. We have various things that can easily get in the way and that can take our focus off of you. Help us to, just for a short bit this morning, set those all aside, focusing on you and desiring to hear from you through your word. Lord, we ask that you would bless this time that we have and that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to understand. Lord, teach us through your word, instruct us, guide us, Help us, change us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, they, they say that a picture is worth a thousand words. And in this morning, we meet a couple of people that make for some very vivid pictures. This is our uh, passage we're going to be looking at this morning of Jesus. He's teaching there in the courtyard of the temple. And the scribes and the Pharisees are going to confront him. They're going to bring a woman, probably crying and, and just horrified, there into his midst as he's teaching. A woman that we know is the woman caught in adultery. And so into that, you see a very vivid picture. One, the first picture is of a group of people, the scribes and the Pharisees. Um, who were these people? Well, the, the scribes were the guardians of the scripture. They would faithfully copy it word by word, letter by letter, make a new copy, get done with that copy, and start a new one. And each letter, each page, if they messed up, they had to throw it away and, and start that page over. It was a laborious process. And in, in the process of that, if you think about if that was their job, if that was their job to, to copy scriptures, to, to make a faithful copy of the previous copy so that it would be you know, this is before copy machines and printers. This is how scripture would be um, communicated, passed on. It relied on people to make faithful copies. And so this was their job. This was their full-time job. And you can imagine that they knew because of their job, they knew the scriptures inside and out. Maybe they even had large chunks of it memorized from having copied it over and over on a regular basis. Then you have the... Uh, the Pharisees. They're the, the teachers and the interpreters of the law. They're the rabbis. They're the ones that could be expected by the rest of the people, the Jewish people, to look to these individuals to help them properly understand, interpret, explain, and apply the law of Moses, particularly the Torah was where their, their focus was, because that, that's what contained all the things that they desired so strongly to live by. So you can imagine these Pharisees having grown up, having studied in the rabbinic schools under the prominent rabbis. Um, they basically went to what we would call an academy. They would have had an excellent education, an excellent understanding of the finer details and the points of the law and how, or at least according to their teachers, how they had been taught to live according to those. So both groups essentially do have a lot in common. This is really the first time we've seen them together, named together in the Gospel of John, but they occur together a lot throughout the other three Gospels. And they had a lot, of com a lot in common and a lot that they could collaborate on. Both of them believed that properly keeping the law of Moses was the means of obtaining righteousness, which was unfortunately essentially self-righteousness. But for these two groups, the law was essentially their everything. And sadly, what it became was many times a weapon that they wielded in order to justify themselves and to condemn everyone else. So the, the thing that was common to all of these groups was that they shared this sort of legalistic, works-based faith. They knew the law. They knew it really, really well. But they didn't understand the law. 
They didn't understand its essential purpose. If you think back and you you go to the 10,000 foot level, what was the purpose of the law of Moses? Its purpose was to reveal the guilt of everyone who read it and to cause the people to do some soul searching and come to the recognition that they only were left with a desperate need for God's help. That's our first picture, these religious leaders. The second picture is of the one kneeling down there, Jesus Christ. Jesus, you know, kind of in contrast with the Pharisees, had grown up learning carpentry in Nazareth and not sitting in the best rabbinic schools in Jerusalem. He was not trained as a scribe. You know, he'd he'd never entered into that line of work of faithfully copying the scriptures by hand again and again and again. However, what is so clearly obvious as we read scripture and was clearly obvious to everyone who encountered our Lord was that his understanding of the scriptures surpassed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. Why? Because he says it himself, essentially he had sat at the feet of the author. So Jesus not only knew the scriptures better than them, he understood something they didn't and that was their essential purpose and the heart of the one that gave them. So Jesus approached the scriptures as the only one who was perfectly righteous, as the only one who kept their requirements perfectly, and the only one who truly, actually understood their origin, he he knew the source, their intent, and their essential purpose. Really what we could say is the heart of the law, the law of Moses and the scriptures generally. So Jesus, even more than this, he knew also the nature of human beings, right? He, he, as a member of the Godhead, would know humans better than anyone else. He understood that the greatest problem faced by those who thought they understood the law so well, or had been influenced by those who taught them the law, was essentially this underlying self-righteousness that prevented them from correctly applying the law or understanding its true purpose because they were so adamant about, sadly, weaponizing the law to condemn everyone else. So you get these two pictures, and, and, and Jesus, as the second picture, understood that the number one problem faced, that he faced, wasn't the, the hostility of the religious leaders, even as hostile as they were, but rather their arrogant, sinful pride to which they were so completely oblivious. I'm going to say that again. It was their arrogant, sinful pride to which they were so oblivious. They couldn't see it. And so much of Jesus' ministry, when you look at sort of the nuts and bolts of how he went about his ministry, so much of what he had to do was to try and help people who couldn't recognize that there was anything wrong with them to see that there was a sinful nature to themselves, to kind of shine the mirror back on themselves. Just to kind of set the stage, how did we get here before we get into these two pictures of these religious leaders and our Lord Jesus? If we back up just a few verses, last time we looked at the second half of chapter 7, starting in verse 31, where we see that Jesus is in the temple, and it's the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot, the Feast of Booths. It has a variety of different names you might hear hear it called. Um, But it was this big, massive festival in Jerusalem. Naturally, there were big crowds present, and a lot of people had heard Jesus teach. And they apparently, as we noted last time, had already heard Jesus directly, or they'd heard about him, but they mentioned his miracles. They had witnessed his miracles or they at least heard a lot about them. And initially, they were inclined to believe, not necessarily that Jesus was their Messiah, but more that he seemed like he could possibly be their Messiah. And they even said so, that they deduced that Jesus might be the Messiah, because they couldn't imagine that when the Messiah came, he could perform more miracles than what Jesus had been doing in their day. But this doesn't sit well with the Another group, the Pharisees, um, connected with the chief priests, these leaders of the Sanhedrin, they, they hear about this initial reaction from the crowd and it upsets them. They issue this fearful response. 
And you think, well, why were they so fearful? Why did they respond to Jesus the way they did? Well, it was because they saw him as a threat, as one who threatened to undermine their power. And the response of those in power has always been suppression. This must stop immediately so that it doesn't start to spread. We noted last time that Free thought, free speech, the fostering of critical thinking and creative expression are directly connected to our being made in the image of God, and sinful human beings will always try to stifle and crush that, but these are humanity's greatest of all qualities. You know, I'd say that as we look to this even further, um, we kind of look at the response of these religious leaders, and, and we see people who we noted last time, just didn't really want to understand, just didn't really try to understand what Jesus was teaching. And the reason they didn't want or try to understand what Jesus was communicating to them was that we noted last time they had their own agenda. And that, you know, that may seem like, okay, well, that was fine for the religious leaders of Jesus' day, but is that true today? And the answer is yes, that's very true today as well. It's always been true of people because people haven't changed. That many people today, sadly even Christians, will hear God's truth, but they just don't listen to God's truth. They don't want to understand or try to understand what God is teaching them because they're too busy with everything else in their lives, and at many times at the heart of it is their own agenda. So we, we said last time that God's message for you is to want and to try to understand what he's communicating to you. If you desire and are willing to pursue God's will with a teachable and soft heart, he will infuse you with a supernatural ability to understand divine truth. God works in amazing ways. We see that um, what Jesus is in the midst of during this Feast of Tabernacles. It was a celebration of how God had worked in the history of his people, how he had brought them through their time of wandering in the wilderness. And he had brought them out of living in tents, basically, camping out in the desert, to establishing them in their permanent home in the land that he promised to them. It was a great blessing for them to, to come into the promised land, but it was a miraculous recognition of how he sustained them against all odds out there in the heat in the in the parched desert wilderness land they didn't have food they didn't have water they didn't have clothing they didn't have shelter and God provided each and everything that they needed all along the way so Jesus takes this whole imagery of the feast of tabernacles and he starts to apply it to them to himself he he says you know the, the water that these priests would go and they would dip in the pool of Siloam and then they would they would pour out there around the altar in the temple he applies to himself on the final day of the feast he says basically what God did what they're recognizing by pouring that water has how God had met their physical need for water in the wilderness and he says what What the Lord did through Moses in striking that rock and it became a fountain of water flowing, it didn't, you know, against all odds, that doesn't make any sense. Like Rocks just don't start flowing with water. But Jesus said, that's what I came to do in a spiritual sense. What God had done to meet a physical need, Jesus said, I've come to meet a spiritual need. And he goes a step further to say that the, the water was a representation of the outflowing of the Holy Spirit. And this is what Jesus promised to anyone who would respond to his invitation. And he, as we know, the rest of the story, he made good on that promise in Acts chapter 2. And so Jesus is offering to the people listening to him a great invitation. And that invitation comes with a great promise. And we said that he extended it not only to those that were interested and who were receptive, to, but to even those who were hostile to him. To everybody who was present, he extended the same invitation, and that's how God works. He extends his, his offer to every single member of the human race. It doesn't matter what our background is, our status is, our, our level of understanding, or our willingness, or our Um, eagerness versus our hostility, the offer stands the same for everyone. God's invitation, that specific mechanism 
For understanding what God is communicating to you is the Holy Spirit. What a great blessing we mentioned last time. There's just nothing that can compare to the miracle of the Holy Spirit dwelling inside every believer in Jesus Christ. Jesus issues it here as a promise. It was fulfilled as an amazing gift. And it's available to everyone who is a believer in Jesus Christ. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Think about how amazing and powerful and awesome that is. Our responsibility is not to quench the Holy Spirit, but to be soft-hearted and teachable and to seek to understand what God is doing in and through us. And it amounts to nothing less than an, an abundant fountain of life, working wonders within and even flowing out of us to share God's rich treasures with others. We At the end of the chapter, we see... Um, this arresting party, they basically have the temple police sent to go and arrest Jesus and haul him back before these um, members of the Sanhedrin and, and the Pharisees. They're, they're acting as, as the authorities in this instance. But as they go, they don't even make it to Jesus, these, these temple police. They get stopped in their tracks, and they're just listening, and they get mesmerized. And they just can't proceed. And they don't even seem to understand why, but they come back before these religious leaders and they call them to account. They said, why didn't you bring him back here to us? You know, that's, that was your job. Why did you fail? And their only response is just, it was his teaching. We, we were just t captivated by his teaching. We don't really know. We see this as an instance of where God used the sinful desires of these religious leaders. He used the wrath of men to praise him. And he both at the same time protected Jesus. He physically protected his safety because it wasn't his hour yet. But at the same time, he used these people to speak a profound truth here at the end of chapter 7. They said, never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. How true is that? That's truth for all time. No one will ever speak the way Jesus speaks. And so he uses these, um, these arresting agents, these um, temple police, despite themselves. They were not exactly desiring to go out and to um, be a testimony to the reality of Jesus and his teaching, but that's exactly what happened. So if God, we said last time, if he can use unwilling servants like these guys, what can he do with willing servants? God may have plans to use your willingness. It might seem like a small thing. You think, well, I'm not influential. I'm not someone who has a lot of status or um, power or you know, wealth or anything that would seem to really make a difference in this world. But God says, I want your willingness and if he has your willingness, how might he be able to use that along with your faith, your boldness, to accomplish his will in your generation? And I would say that this generation is unique. This day that we live in is unique. Um, thinking back through your lifetime and my lifetime, has there ever been some really interesting times like we're living in now? I mean, just think of the last two years that we've gone through with the, the COVID lockdowns and measures and confusion and what that's meant for our lives, what that's meant for our world. And, you know, we just come out of that and it seems like all the, the forces of the nations of the earth are wanting to uh, propel the world into war. And, you know, we just think what a, what a crazy time to be living in. Well, the reality is that God has it all under control. And then he has placed you at this time for exactly his purposes. He says, I want you to be my servant, to shine my light, my truth into this dark world. If you're just willing, will you be willing? The religious leaders also we see they had a lot of disdain. They, they speak very um, in a negative derogatory word, way of these Galileans, you know, uh, you know, what are you, Galileans? You know, Nicodemus, are you a Galilean too? They really had this um, 
perspective that looked down on people that were not, as they viewed, sophisticated, that they were, you know, kind of these country people. And the world will always ridicule those that it doesn't like or understand. But our responsibility, yours and mine, is not to take on the world's perspective, but to focus in on God's perspective. The only thing that matters is how God sees you. Know and remember, and this dovetails with our message today, that your worth and your identity are found not in this world, but in Jesus Christ. And with that, that's an absolute game changer. So that brings us right in here. Take a look at chapter 8, verse 1, and we'll read through our passage here. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. So the eighth day, this final day of the Feast of Tabernacles, has ended. Everybody starts to slowly disperse. Um, you know, some have to take off right away to get back to work. Others maybe want to spend a couple more days with their family in Jerusalem before slowly making their way out. So people are kind of just slowly dispersing one way or another from Jerusalem. But Jesus, he goes across the Kidron Valley and up onto the Mount of Olives. It was a serene place, a place he liked to spend time. Now early in the morning, he came again into the temple. And all the people came to him and he sat down and he taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. What do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So here is our, our text. And as we, as we get into the details here, um, just to kind of recap, again, they're in Jerusalem. There's probably some of these temporary structures. This is a particularly large one here in the foreground. Um, they, they, they still do this on the Feast of Tabernacles to this day. They go out and they collect certain um, types of wood, and they construct just kind of this really basic shelter, kind of this boxy shelter. The, the framing is made of wood, and then today they'll usually use like canvas, um, to, to make a covering of the sides, but they can use palm branches, they can use leaves, they can use whatever, they might decorate them a little bit. But it's basically just a place where they have this place to go, this unique place to go. They can set it up on a patio or a balcony or a rooftop or just about anywhere they can find space. Um, here's another view of one, a much smaller one. You can see the palm branch around the doorway. They've kind of made it decorative. So this is, you know, this is modern day. This is if you go to Jerusalem, this is the kind of thing you could expect to see. Um, it's just pretty basic. This one's got a little table in it. Um, traditionally, Jews will attempt to eat about one meal per day in their little temporary shelter. So this might be one, you know, a, a shelter that a, a little booth tabernacle that they would use for like one person or a couple people uh, versus this one might be for a hundred people. I don't know. Um, but it was just kind of a, a fun, festive setting. Now it's just come to an end. And Jesus, as it comes to an end, he goes out to the Mount of Olives. It was a place where he regularly spent time praying. You think about this, again, these pictures, these two pictures, Jesus and the religious leaders, very different. And Jesus had been at the Mount of Olives, sort of resting and, and recuperating and praying. By contrast, these religious leaders were about to find out had spent that exact same time after this final day of the Feast of Tabernacles doing something else, planning, 
and plotting and scheming. So Jesus gets up the next morning. We'll put our verse up here, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him. And he sat down and taught them. So he comes into the temple courtyard, very massive complex, the temple in Jerusalem. It was very impressive. It had these big courtyards that could hold a lot of people. And he picks his spot strategically. It's in a place of the temple called the Court of Women. Um, Now, it was also known as the temple treasury grounds because it's also where the treasury was located. But it was, it was a very open area. It was open to a lot of people who could, who could come, both men and women. It was the place in the temple, particularly, where women could come to worship and pray. As I mentioned as we were beginning this morning, we all have a desire, hopefully, to come and to meet with God. And this was the place where women in this day could do that. They could come and they could have space and they could come to the place of worship and they could come and they could meet with God. What a wonderful opportunity, a time to reflect on Scripture, a time to reflect on God's faithfulness, a time of prayer. It was a public setting. Jesus uses this setting. He takes a seat, the normal posture of a rabbi, He's got a a group around him who are interested in what he has to teach. And he begins a teaching session. It's just a, you know, a group setting. People that are interested, who want to learn, who want to understand more, who are curious. Maybe they heard him speak the other instances this last week where he's been there teaching. You know, it's it's this, um, I don't don't know exactly what the nature of this was, but um, just culturally, it's so interesting how the culture of the Middle East is so very similar to the culture of Africa. And, you know, when I was in West Africa on a short-term mission trip, I observed that in the villages, uh, the villages were um, basically you had a larger tribe that would be present in an area, and then there would be villages within that tribe, and then each village would have its chief. It would be, you know, kind of one uh, usually very elderly gentlemen that they all sort of uh, recognized as, as the village authority. And I, I noticed that we would all sit on the ground. And there was only one person who was ever allowed to sit on a stool or a chair, and that was this individual. It was the, the chief. It was the elder. It was the, the top guy. And there was a, a deference to, to those who, who were older. And um, I don't know how much that carries through, but um, it, it, the missionaries made very clear to us, they're like, do not sit on a chair. Whatever you do, don't sit on a chair. Stay on the ground. Um, that's the proper posture for, for this uh, cultural setting, and if you violate that, you're going to cause all kinds of problems. Um, but nevertheless, you, you have a group of people who are probably sitting, maybe some were standing, but they're, they're there to learn and to listen. And Jesus takes this posture. I don't know if he's sitting on the ground or on some kind of a stool, but he sits. And it's this kind of a setting, um, it's, it's a, a nice Bible study, essentially. They're all enjoying the time, it's, it's been a great week, it's been a, a week of festivities. Everybody comes to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. It's a big holiday, it's like Thanksgiving or Christmas. It's, it's one of those times when everybody comes, they gather with family and they, it's festive, it's wonderful. But as we've just seen in chapter 7, that gets rudely interrupted gets rudely interrupted by hostilities, by religious leaders that are trying to do away with Jesus. They're trying to arrest him. They're they're up to no good. The whole time Jesus is celebrating and they're trying to kill him. We have a similar setting here in chapter 8 that he's just trying to teach the people. It's just a, a wonderful small group Bible study. They're having their study and all of a sudden we're about to see it get rudely rudely interrupted. Verse 3, then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery, and when they set her in the midst, I can imagine that she, they had to pull her, grab her, bring her. She's probably 
crying and, and just absolutely horrified. Yes, she had been involved in sin, and we don't know all the details of that, but imagine her, her sin just gets put abs- out in public in front of everyone on public display, and she's being you know, tormented and, and humiliated, and this had to be just an awful, awful situation for her. So she's dragged against her will into this court of the temple where there's tons of people. It's a public setting. She's being humiliated. And, the, and even to add to that, they're interrupting Jesus' Bible study. And says so they, they set her down there in the midst. It's so rudely interrupted. And what are they going to do? They're basically going to put her on trial. They said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Um, Now, as we look at verse 3, the thing we need to note right off the bat is that there was a procedure for this, um, that the law of Moses set out that, you know, essentially the witnesses would come forward, there there was a, a, a proper time and a place and a setting for this, and it wasn't out in the middle of the temple courtyard, and it wasn't in front of Jesus. Like, he, he was a, a teacher, but he wasn't the proper authority. This wasn't the right place to hold a trial. There was a proper channel for this, but the religious leaders obviously ignored that because they had an agenda. And the scribes and Pharisees, you know, they, they bring this poor woman and to her, she is just a sinner. She's just someone that they could really care less about. They didn't know her. They didn't, well, maybe some of them knew her, but they didn't care one thing about her. The thing that we see is that they, they basically classified this woman the way they classified most people as sinners. To them, she was impersonal. She had uh, done something um, and then as a response to that, they did something that we can all do if we're not careful. And namely, that is to start to characterize people, to start to stereotype people, to dismiss people, or even, worse comes to worse, to dehumanize people. But you know, as human beings, we're, we're pretty good at that. Um, look at verse 5. Now, in Moses, in the law, commanded that such be stoned. But what do you say? So they basically put this to Jesus as if, um, you know, here's the right answer. We're, now we dare you to disagree with this. You know, are you going to agree with this? What do you say? But, you know, they, they, they drag this poor woman in, and they basically um, look at her as just, you know, a terrible person, just a sinner. They've already begun to dehumanize her. But we contrast that with God. People um, look at other people in a very impersonal way so much of the time. But God is personal, and he cares deeply about each individual, you and me, and everyone. This woman, she's not going to uh, regain her personhood her unique and personal identity until she encounters the personal God. And there you see him pictured. You see him sitting there teaching. We can take away something from this about personhood, that human beings are very good, unfortunately, at dehumanizing one another. But God cares for each individual because he made them unique. Every person is valuable because they bear his image. So God's call to each one who is a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, who is indwelt by the Holy Spirit, is to constantly fight against the human tendency to characterize, to dismiss, to dehumanize, to stereotype people, and to show people mercy, and to try to get to know people. I think that's a really important lesson that we see um, when we look at sort of a what not to do with these religious leaders. They, they didn't have much care, any care, for this woman as a person. Looking at, um, at verse 4 there, it says, 
Then they said to him, teacher, this woman has been, I'll put that back there. This woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. The, the word there in Greek, autophoros, is a combination of two words, self, um, autos, and for, thief. It ar- originally meant who, someone who was caught in the act of stealing, or we might say caught red-handed. Um, but by the time this word has made its way through the decades to Jesus' day, it had come to be used for any kind of um, crime or thing that a person was caught red-handed doing. As we look at verse 5, um, now Moses in the law commanded that such should be stoned, but what do you say? As you look back in the law, the Torah, um, you have various, um, various things spelled out, and then the book of like Leviticus, Deuteronomy in, in particular go into a lot of extra detail. It's kind of like a, a volume of case law that exists in a court system of how this plays out in specific instances. How do, how do we apply this to the various settings and details um, of what is prescribed in the law of Moses? It started to be laid out in Exodus there at Mount Sinai, and it just kind of got unpacked and unpacked throughout the Torah, first five books of the Old Testament. And there were various scenarios outlined by the law that involved um, adultery. Some involved death by stoning for both parties. Um, Others prescribed death by stoning for just the man or yet others for just the woman, depending on the specifics of the situation. But I would say that the majority, um, the the large majority, um, included the death penalty by stoning for both parties involved. Both were, were guilty of that infraction. The, uh, we, we look at this and we can infer a couple of things. One is that the man that was involved in this case of adultery uh, could very well have been present alongside this woman's accusers. He may have been one of the bystanders. Um, we also can see, maybe he was even one of the accusers, we don't know, um, but we also know, secondly, that the religious leaders were distorting the law. And we can pretty well be sure of this because they were ignoring the punishment which would have been due to the man who was involved as well, which was also death by stoning. Probably if they had been pressed on it, they would have said, well, we, we've got the woman right now. Let's just deal with her first. We can deal with the man later, you know, just kind of. Uh, try to buy time, just pass that off or something like that. But as we know, the end of the story, it doesn't go that direction. Jesus could have, um, at this point, protested. He could have spoken up saying, well, yeah, but you know, the, the man, he needs to receive the same punishment, um, which probably from these accusers would have produced a bunch of excuses and would have maybe started an argument with Jesus, but it would not have produced the same result, which we know is coming because we've read this before, and that is the understanding, the sense of shame on the part of those who were present who were bringing these charges. And on multiple occasions, these religious leaders had tried to do what they're doing here. And that is to drive a wedge between Jesus and Moses. They revered Moses, they revered the law of Moses, and they're trying to um, show everyone that Jesus is not one of us. He's not of our tradition. He doesn't care about the law of Moses the way we do. He doesn't revere Moses the way we do. He, he's, not, he's not kosher. And this seems like probably the perfect chance from their perspective to put Jesus into an impossible spot. In baseball, you might call this a, a pickle, right? Uh, you're not likely to get out of it. Sometimes you see the base runners do get out of it, but not, not usually. So notice how the scribes and Pharisees who knew Scripture so well, but were here using this woman for their sinister purposes, also use Scripture for their sinister purposes. And that's really sad when we see that happen, when God's words, the words of Scripture, which are designed to give life and which abound in grace and mercy, are used by sinful people for their own ends, to suit their purposes. They, they wield God's word as a club, usually by 
pulling verses out of context and using them to shame and demean and, and manipulate and guilt trip other people. And you know, that's what the scribes and Pharisees were doing by framing this woman in the way that they're doing. All the while, ignoring their own sin and what the law of Moses had prescribed for the sin of the man who was involved. And so I just, I feel so bad for this woman. She was guilty and there's no getting around that. And, you know, Jesus is going to come very much to terms with that. But she, uh, you know, just putting yourself in this spot, it's, it's, it's like everyone's worst nightmare to have yourself dragged in front of others, publicly humiliated. It's just terrible. And so looking ahead to verse 6, and they said, testing him, this they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. Now, this is really interesting because for a number of reasons. First of all, the scribes and Pharisees really couldn't care less about this woman. They, they were using her for their purposes. Um, they were also not concerned about righteousness or justice. The only thing that this verse makes clear to tell us is that they only wanted to trap Jesus. They wanted to put him in an impossible spot. They wanted to get him stuck between, we could say, a rock and a hard place. You know, wedged in there where he's stuck. On the one hand, if Jesus replied that the penalty required by the law was too strict, or and that caused him to say, well, you know, we need to waive this penalty. The, you know, the, the law is just uh, too harsh, and um, you, know, you can see the inherent problem in that. That if he did that, he would be accused of violating the law by refusing to acknowledge that she was a sinner who deserved death. Now, on the other hand... Jesus and his whole ministry, who affiliated himself with all manner of sinners and presented himself as a friend of sinners, if he gave her accusers the green light and said, yeah, go ahead, stone her, um, she's, she's guilty. Don't even worry about you know, putting her through any kind of trial or, or test or um, you know, just, just kill her. They could have possibly accused him of hypocrisy, Think about it this way. Um, you know, that he says um, that he's a, a friend of sinners. He's been saying in the previous chapter that whoever believes in him would have life through his shed blood, but in reality, he just came to shed the blood of sinners. Uh, James Boyce puts it this way. Um, they could say, you know, sure, this, this Jesus of Nazareth, this teacher... That's gaining so much attention. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. But he doesn't tell you that if you do that, he's going to stone you. So they've got Jesus in a spot right where they want him. And they're basically daring him to disagree with them. This is what the law says. You, don't you agree that this is what it says? Therefore, it's death for this woman. And they really didn't care what happened to her. That wasn't they, they really didn't even care about, um, you know, anything that had to do with the situation. And in fact, I think that they probably had manipulated it to one sense or another. So Jesus, what does he do? Well, he just kind of, um, and the, the wording in the Greek is he kind of just uh, leans forward and he, he starts writing uh, on the ground. And um, we oftentimes think of this as Jesus drawing in dirt, but I actually think that this courtyard of the, uh, of the temple complex was paved, um, that it had stone as its flooring. Now, um, if you've read otherwise, let me know. Um, but I believe that because of that, you know, there's been so much speculation. What was Jesus doing? What was he writing? Um, if it was dirt, everybody could see exactly what he was writing. But if he was just making motions on a, uh, a paved surface, then no one would really know what he was writing. Um, but essentially, I think what Jesus is writing is completely irrelevant, and that's why um, it's not told to us what he was writing. What's important is that he was writing. That Jesus, at first, he seems to be kind of ignoring them. And I think that's 
exactly what he meant to communicate. They knew that he heard them, but he wasn't responding. And they were just getting more and more upset. They were very upset with this woman from the start. They've come to Jesus with this sense of urgency. They, they want him to acknowledge them right then. They want him to take action right then. And they want, most of all, him to answer them. And they start demanding that he answer them. But Jesus, by this act of just sort of writing on the ground, he purposely answers them. He answers them. And he answers them with silence. And he's intending to show, by the very act of doing nothing, that what they were doing was wrong and that what they were bringing forward to him was not worthy of being heard. So Jesus accomplished a lot by this simple act of writing on the ground. First, he he bought time. He gave him time to really pick his words carefully, to choose his tone. Second, it took the attention, and this is really important, off of the woman. It took it off of the woman who had up to that point been the focus. You know, she's being dragged in and then plopped down in front of them. And all the attention now comes off of the woman and it goes squarely onto Jesus. And as these religious leaders are pressing into Jesus, they're directing their focus at Jesus. Every eye is now on him. And now it's on him just sort of doodling on the ground and not on the woman who's standing there in humiliation and shame. Um, You know, I, I have to think that this whole scene may have been even more complicated and even more uncomfortable if the woman was scantily clothed. And, and we're not told what she's wearing, but, uh, you know, you can just imagine. But I think that we can take this and we can see something, a, a third thing in sort of the, um, what Jesus accomplished by doing this, of, of writing on the ground. And that is that he sent this clear message to everyone that what the religious leaders were doing was inappropriate. It wasn't the right setting. It wasn't the right way of going about it. It was um, pushed forward. They were rushing. Um, and it was, it was just wrong. And that Jesus is not interested in entering in. So it accomplishes these three things. And his opponents misinterpret his silence. They think that because Jesus is silent, they must have, oh, they must have stumped him. But Jesus' silence was designed to shame his enemies. Unfortunately, they're not acting at all ashamed by what they're doing. And his silence starts to give them the impression that they have him in a disadvantaged position. They're they're winning the day. They're winning the argument. They're they're putting Jesus into this impossible spot that they want him in. And so they just need him to respond. And so they're pressing and pressing for him to respond. And And his writing on the ground, ignoring them, just has no effect on these religious leaders. They get even more indignant and insistent and upset and demanding. And you think, well, how come they're not able to take a step back? How come they're not able to, um, in in the moment, to say, okay, maybe we need to slow this down. Maybe we need to rethink this. And I think there's a principle that we see about the reality of sin. One of the things that sin does is it tends to harden a person. That, you know, maybe you've gotten to that um, point, a point in your life where you, you've begun with a certain sin and it just starts to snowball. And sin tends to harden as the person becomes even more entrenched in their sin. And this can happen to all of us. But nothing begun in sin will turn out well in the end. It began with hostility to Jesus, and it caused them to devise this sinful plan to entrap this woman, but it's all about to go south. They were about to have the tables turned on them. They were about to be cut with conviction. They were about to look really, really foolish. And once people start to go down a dark path, Unfortunately, what happens is they usually dig in and become more and more determined to continue down that path, even if it will eventually take them, take them to places they never wanted to go and cost them everything. You know, I, I think of the analogy of if you're driving on the highway, and, you know, we have this all the time around here on the two-lane highways, that you're driving, 
and you get behind somebody going really slow, and you think, I got to get past this person. You know, I'm, I'm going to be 10 minutes late if I keep following behind this person going 45 on Highway 97. So I got I to gotta pass. And so you, you start to go into the pass, and you're like, okay, I got to commit to this pass, right? I got to floor it. I got to get around. But maybe you start the pass, and you see, oh, there's actually a car coming. This is not a good time to pass. Well, that's your opportunity to hit the brake and to get back over. But sometimes what you see in the news that's so tragic is people, they, they're, they're like, no, I'm committed, and they floor it, and, and they try to race up ahead, and they put themselves into a terrible spot with an oncoming car. Why? Because they're committed to it. They've begun it, and they're not going to abandon it, and that's how this is with sin, that, that maybe you, you find this with, if you start with a lie, we've all been here, you start with a lie, and pretty soon you got to maintain that lie. And pretty soon you got to start lying to other people in order to preserve this lie. And, and you just have to try, what was my narrative to begin with? And you got to keep it going and it builds and it builds and it just becomes more and more and more of a problem because you committed to it and you're like, I can't let go of it now. But look at how God works. The great news is that path of sin can be abandoned at any time. Imagine how much heartache and pain you can save yourself if you just stop early like the car, you, you get back on the right path. You admit you blew it, and you get back on God's path. You don't have to waste time and, and suffer due to sinful pride. God's forgiveness and grace is always waiting for you. All you have to do at any time is relent and repent. There you will always find God's grace, love, and restoration. He's always waiting to forgive. His grace is always there for you. He's always ready to welcome you back, to restore you, and to watch you get back on the right path once again. Sin hardens, but grace awaits. Let's look at verse 7. So they continued asking him, and he raised himself up, so he, he stands up, and they're like, okay, he's going to talk. This is our chance. We, we've got him trapped. Let's see what kind of stupid thing he says. But in the, fa in the reality, he says something actually quite the opposite, something quite profound. He doesn't go for one of the only two answers that they thought that he could give. He gives a very different answer. He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her. So the scribes and Pharisees were not going to let Jesus continue ignoring them. And, and so they keep um, they're becoming more and more incensed. They demand that he answer them. And they're going to keep hounding him until he answers. And Jesus, he... Uh, He's going, to not, uh, he's going to not give in to their demands, but he is going to answer them. And he's going to do so in such a way that, his accuser, that the accusers of this woman have to admit their own guilt. Each one will have to come to terms with his own possible involvement, have to come to terms with the manipulation of using the law for their purposes, all of which is going to make them look very bad. So Jesus, instead of jumping to judge this woman, he actually judges her accusers. I think we see another principle here, and that is Jesus, give, Jesus has access to wisdom beyond anything that they're expecting. He's able to give an answer that is profound and that confounds them because he's not limited to this world's wisdom. Do you think that's true for all of us? I would say that it absolutely is and that as we look to Scripture, um, Jesus knew where to find wisdom and understanding. Uh, we, we find that in Proverbs 9.10. I'll read that really quickly. Proverbs 9, verse 10 says, "...the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom." And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Jesus had compassion. He had forgiveness. He focused on the future and not on the past. He understood the situation is what enabled him to be able to not be fooled by the religious talk of the scribes and the Pharisees. It's what enabled him to not immediately jump to conclusions and condemn the adulterous woman. It's what enabled him to not be swayed by the peer pressure of being in a public setting in a, a crowd and wanting to try and please the crowd. It's what allowed Jesus to gain God's perspective of wisdom and understanding that enabled, enabled him to see all the motives, the good, the bad, what was actually going on underneath the surface. 
We all need this same kind of wisdom and understanding that begins from above. God's desire for you is that you pursue the same precious wisdom and understanding that comes only from above. So it's available to all of us. He had wisdom and understanding. He had compassion. He had forgiveness. His compassion enabled him to approach the situation and approach this woman from a place of actual, genuine concern and empathy. He approached this woman as he approached everyone as sheep in need of a shepherd and sinners in need of a savior. He had forgiveness. You know, forgiveness is difficult for every one of us. When we have been sinned against, it's very difficult. You know, when, when there's been things that have happened to us that are very harmful and very hurtful, it can be incredibly difficult to forgive. I speak that personally, and I think that's just true for all of us people, human beings. But how much more difficult is it for God to forgive us who have sinned so terribly against him? It's been said, and it's quite powerful, that no other God has wounds. Jesus was focused on the future and not the past. He offered the woman a second chance. He knew her past sin. He knew her shame, but he also knew her bright future. He challenged her to make a change and to move forward. He says, okay, we're going we're gonna to start over here. He gave her a chance and a future by freeing her from her past. God never writes anyone off. He is the God of second chances. Doesn't mean she wasn't guilty. She was. But there's just more going on here when you look at the totality of... It's so interesting that they bring this before Jesus. Because they're bringing it to him from the standpoint of, let's let him judge this woman. Ha, 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 we got him. We, we pinned him down. We've got him trapped. But in reality, he is in the spot to judge this woman. He is the ultimate judge, the fair and righteous judge. He's the one that does get to make this decision. And in addition to that, he is perfectly righteous. He is the one that can condemn her. Um, and this is all brought directly to him. Let's look at um, verse 8 here. And, and again, so he makes this profound statement, and then he, again, he just kind of um, returns back to writing on the ground. He, again, is just not ready to focus in on this woman the way that they want him to. He's, he's not um, directing his ire at her the way they are. What we see in Jesus is that he deals with this confrontation in a different kind of a way. He forced the men to examine themselves and to consider their own sinfulness. He who is without sin among you, let him throw the first stone at her. So the accusers were convicted by their own guilty consciences. He, he lays out a condition that they don't argue with. I don't know that this is necessarily spelled out anywhere in the law, but they recognize that Jesus isn't telling them something that isn't right. He recognizes that they are very guilty as well. Now, the older men, um, I find this interesting, verse um, 9, then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last, to the youngest. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. So why the older ones start first? I think that they had enough life experience and enough common sense to know how badly this had the ability to turn out for the accusers if they continued pressing. So the, they set the tone by getting up. They wised up. They realized the best thing to do is to cut their losses and walk away. And then once they do, the others start to follow their example. But by walking away from this confrontation with Jesus, these self-righteous scribes and Pharisees and everyone else gathered there essentially admitted that they all were unrighteous. They admit that they understood to one degree or another that they had been applying to this woman the law. They'd been applying the law to this woman, but not to themselves. The scribes and the Pharisees were violating both the spirit and the letter of the law. They thought that they were defending Moses, but in reality, they were being very hypocritical. Let's look at verse 10 here. Then when Jesus had raised himself up, 
and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? Now, her accusers had basically used her as bait. They had tried to use her to set a trap for Jesus. We don't know all the details. What was the men's involvement? How did they set this up? We don't really know. But nevertheless, they, they had been plotting, they had been planning, they had been manipulating things. And Jesus just says, where are they? And um, has no one condemned you? And then I, I like how, Jesus, how she answers Jesus in verse 11 um, in Spanish, uh, ninguno, senor. No one, sir or, or Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. But he qualifies it, go and sin no more. He says, this is me giving you a do-over. Now, people might, people really get upset with this sometimes. They think, why can Jesus do this? Why can he, why is he not holding her to the standard of the law? She is guilty. But it gets back to the question, if, if um, God is sovereign, if Jesus is the fair and righteous judge, does he not get to make decisions? Um, right? Sometimes I, I think about this in terms of like sports. You know, the, the referee on the field, especially in certain sports like basketball or, or soccer, the re- in baseball, the umpire at home plate, he gets to make the call. And, um, you know, the, the players may not always like it, but he has that prerogative. So if God decides to have mercy on someone, if he decides to extend his grace to someone, to a sinner, can he not do that? And I think we see him doing exactly that. And he doesn't, um, he doesn't try to dismiss what she did. He doesn't try to say that she's not guilty. He just says, I'm not going to apply the penalty that you deserve. Instead, I'm going to extend to you grace and give you a second chance, and this is your new beginning. And that is who God is. He's the, the God of new beginnings. And so Jesus gives this traumatized woman a second chance. James Boyce says, this story reveals sin's horror. And of course, I do not mean the sin of the woman, I mean the sin of the rulers. He says, well, adultery is sin, certainly. This woman was accused of adultery, but compared to the sin of the men who were using her in an attempt to trap Jesus, her sin was actually minimal. So it was was the sinfulness of in these religious leaders that they couldn't recognize in themselves that was the big elephant in the room, the big problem of the day. And Jesus brings it out to the open. He gets them to one degree or another to recognize it. So we see a principle here, and it has to do with sin. And and sometimes people say, well, um, why focus on sin? Why focus on sin? Don't we want to just focus um, on God... uh, you know, on on happy things? Don't we want to focus on God's grace? Don't we want to focus on um, God's other attributes? Why why sin, right? And and there can be a wrong focus on sin. So focus on sin in itself can, can be a problem if it's separated from the attributes of God, if it's separated from the bigger context. But I would argue this morning that it is important that we all focus on sin, but that we do so correctly And here's why. Because if we ignore sin in ourselves, see, the the tendency is to focus on sin in everyone else, right? Those people over there, they're sinners. Those people, they are terrible. Those people need to fix it. They need to get it together. Them, 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 them. And I think, you know, you see certain of these um, church groups. I remember there, there was a church in Kansas. I don't know if they're still doing it, but they would go out and they would rail against the sins of others. But we can't deal with the sins of others until we deal with our own sins. And we have to come to a recognition like in our our scripture reading this morning, the Apostle Paul, he's a a fantastic example. He started with the premise. You know, talk about someone who impacted the world for God in a powerful, amazing way, an apostle. Someone who started churches. Someone who went on mission trips all over the Gentile world, the first missionary on all these journeys just had this passion for bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to everyone he could. But what made him such an effective servant for the Lord was that he first understood his own sinfulness. 
Now, what our Lord teaches here is that we must deal, if we're going to deal with the sin of others, we first have to recognize that we too are sinners and that we're vulnerable to sin as well. The way that we deal with sin is by taking the attitude of the Apostle Paul. The religious leaders didn't deal with their own sin. They just deal, dealt with the sins of everyone else, these scribes and Pharisees. The key is how we deal with others begins with the attitude of Paul who understood that he was the worst of all sinners. That's what he says there in 1 Timothy 1. He, said, he says, I am the worst of all sinners. It's from that perspective that gives him the humility and the perspective to look at the law and to see its failings. He's always exposing the law in a certain way that was, I think, unique. He had this perspective on the law in what it could and couldn't do, and, and he says, you know, legalism isn't going to work. Just trying to abide by a set of rules isn't going to work. You have to get to the heart of it, and Paul understood the heart of the law. And the reason he understood the heart of the law was because he had a heart that understood his own sinfulness. That was the whole point of the law, was to get people to recognize um, the fact that they were sinners and that they needed the Lord. Anything short of this produces the worst in us, which is judgmentalism, hypocrisy, trying to keep up appearances, trying to look good to others. You know, that's been the criticism, I think, of of the church through the years is, you know, it's a bunch of people going around putting on airs, trying to, to, to look the church way, trying to um, act like they've got it all together, trying to act like they're really, you know, on fire for the Lord, like they don't have any sin issues, and, you know, boy, that's hard to relate to. And that is a big problem. But the remedy is recognizing that we are all sinners, recognizing that we need God's grace, recognizing that we need each other, that we're all in this together, and that we're all the worst of sinners. God's will for each of us is that we come to terms with our own sinfulness because that's going to profoundly affect how we understand ourselves and how we relate to others. We can't recognize the value in others until we recognize how much we're valued by God. We can't give others a second chance until we recognize the ultimate second chance that we have all been given by God. And Paul knew that. Paul understood that. We can talk and talk about grace till the Lord returns. But we can't actually show grace to others until we understand the grace that's been shown to us by God. The uh, great missionary to China once said it something like this, "I'm I'm a great sinner, who has been saved by a great Savior. He was speaking at a, a church or conference in Western Australia, and they introduced him as this is the, the great missionary. This is the, the greatest. And they went on and on and on, introducing this great man. And they said he got up, he took the stage, and he said I, you know, something like, I, I appreciate the nice things that have been said about me, but in reality, I'm just a great sinner who's been saved by a great Savior. That's the mindset that God wants all of us to take on, and it is life-giving, and it is transformative, and it's powerful. So I hope that we will take that and we will seek to apply it. And if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, that, that was the situation that so many were in in that temple courtyard. They didn't know Jesus Christ. They, they, they thought that he had something interesting to offer, but they didn't know him. Where does it all begin? It begins with a knowledge that he... Well, it really begins with a knowledge of ourselves, that we're all sinners, that we're all separated from God, and that that leaves us very hopeless and helpless and destitute. But that God in his great love loved you so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to save you, to die, to extend grace to you, to give you that second chance and to give you eternal life through his death on the cross and his shed blood, not requiring the blood of sinners but of shedding his blood for sinners, of which we all are the greatest. And into that, will you accept what Jesus Christ did? He died and gave you the gift of life, of eternal life, of forgiveness of sins, of a new start, of the gift of the Holy Spirit, to being completely transformed in every way by one man, and that's Jesus Christ. He went to the cross, he was crucified, he died. He shed his blood, he he died as your substitute in your place so that you could live. He rose again. He conquered death. He rose again three days later. The first of all of us who trust in him. We have resurrection life just as he had 
if we believe in him, if we trust him, if we receive his gift of eternal life? Will you trust him if you've never done that? Believe in him as your savior. Say, yes, Lord, I'm ready to receive that gift as my own. I want Jesus Christ. I want that to start today. That new life, resurrection life, eternal life, that life-giving, the, kind, the man that we read about in Scripture, the God-man, Jesus Christ, was so radically different. If you say, yes, I, I, I understand what he was all about, and I want what he offers to me, what he did for me, what he accomplished for me on the cross as my own, you tell the Lord and you will have it. It's yours. Let's close in prayer this morning. Father, thank you for this time you've had in your word. I pray, Lord, that you would use this time that we've spent looking at the various details of this profound passage and that it would help us, it would show us who you are, that it would guide us. May we apply these takeaways, these principles that we've observed. May we seek to be like Jesus, to emulate his example. Lord, we pray that we would see in ourselves who we really are, that we are sinners, that we're the worst of sinners. But in that, we, have, we, we see where life is found. We see that abundant life, the ability to accurately understand ourselves and, and to relate to others, begins with a correct view of ourselves. May we know your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your profound love for us, for giving us a second chance, the ultimate second chance through your son, Jesus Christ. We pray that you would use this passage and that it would resonate deep within us and that you would transform it, transform us by it through the inworking of your Holy Spirit. We ask this in, his, in Jesus' name, amen. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer.
Amen.